Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Megan Motto. I'm in my day job, the Chief Executive Officer of the Governance Institute of Australia. Uh, but today I'm here, of course, as a board member of CEDAR, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to today's live stream, which is, of course, the 2022 Trust Barometer, the cycle of distrust. And we're going to discuss the latest findings of that and uh, what it really means for the state of Australia and, and what clues it gives us as to how we continue to develop trust in our society, which, of course, is a, a foundational element of the fabric of society and making our fabric work. Uh, of course, as COVID has continued to fuel a global cycle of distrust, or at least we're, we're going to talk a little bit about how pandemics can be good at the onset, but can, the wheels can fall off quite quickly. Um, Edelman's annual trust barometer has found that business has emerged as, in fact, the most trusted institution in society. But even within that, there's some messages and we're going to unpack those. While people view governments and the media as sources of division, they increasingly look to business to uh, inform policy and provide leadership on, on the issues that count. And of course, we've seen a little bit of that in the media over the last couple of days, and, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, however, the trust afforded to business is not unqualified. And the questions that we're going to be talking about today is, are our institutions worthy of trust? And can business lead the way in rebuilding trust in our society? Now, of course, today and every day, uh, CEDAR acknowledges that we are on Aboriginal land. I'm in Sydney. We're all on Zoom at the moment. And so I'm in Sydney on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. But I'd like to recognise all of the people on all of the lands from wherever you are uh, throughout Australia and I'm just so pleased to be part of an organisation that is committed to reconciliation and uh, recognition of the first owners of our lands. We respect elders past, present and emerging and particularly thank our Indigenous elders for their custodianship of the lands where we all uh, sit on today. Um, custodianship is something that is not only closely tied to the topic of good governance, uh, where I, the land that I live in, where we um, governance is, you know, the, the uh, leaders of our organisations being custodians of those organisations. But of course, it connects really closely with this concept of trust, because custodianship is very much around trust and about uh, living the values that, that we like to see reflected in our society. Now today, uh, as, um, as always, I'd like to acknowledge first and foremost, our partnership with Edelman Australia. Um, the conversations and discussions like these, they're absolutely uh, not possible without the collaboration and exchange of ideas that we have. And so I'd like to thank uh, Edelman for partnering with us on this session. And of always, as always, at all CEDAR events, you can interact. We want our audience to interact through our Q&A portal, which is available via the link on your screen. So if you press on that link at the moment, you can enter in your details by going to cedar.pigeonhole.at. Remember, it's not .com.au, it's AT. Uh, that mistake is often made. And using the passcode barometer today, passcode barometer. So we'd like you to post your questions and also vote on the questions of others. And those that, of course, uh, win the popularity contest and raise to the top, I will be putting to our panellists today. So please make sure that you start to get your questions in. Uh, you can um, forward your questions at any time, but of course, we'll um, answer most of them towards the back end of the session today and we'll get to as many as we can. We'd also, as always, love you to join in the conversation on Twitter using today's hashtag, which is hashtag Trust Barometer, and, of course, tagging in at CEDAR underscore news so that you can be part of our network. Now, I'm not going to make too many more introductory comments on the topic of trust. We all know how important it is. It's the, it's the stuff that glues us together. We go to the hamburger shop, we order a hamburger because we trust that the ingredients are healthy, that they've committed to the health standards, that all of the staff are doing the right things, that they're, they're employers of choice and all of those things. Trust is what glues us together in society. And so the reflection on these results is incredibly important every year. I know I've been fangirling over the Trust Barometer for many, many years. And in fact, uh, I'll, to give a plug to the Governance Institute, we, we do the, the flip side of the Trust Barometer, if you like, which is the ethics index. Ethics, of course, being how you perceive people from the 
inside out and trust is our perception of the outside in. So it's really important that we have these conversations. And on that note, I'm going to pass straight through to the fabulous Susan Redden Makatoa, uh, uh, who is the Executive Vice President, Head of Corporate Edelman APAC, to take us through the key messages from the 2022 Trust Barometer. And then joining us for a discussion afterwards, we will have the, the wonderful youth advocate, uh, Yasmin Poole. So I'll hand over now to you, Susan, to take us through your results. Thank you so much. What a fabulous introduction. Um, just for the next slide, please, just wanted to start with the methodology. Edelman, for those of you who don't know us, are a global communications firm. We've been studying trust now for 22 years, and then we do that by looking at why, how and why people trust the institutions of business, government, media and NGOs to do the right thing. The Trust Barometer is based on an online survey of um, more than 33,000 respondents in 28 countries. The Australian sample of 1,150 is reflective of our general population. What I've done today is put together some key findings for us to discuss. If we could shuffle on, please. Um, these are the headlines. So trust has declined. Um, in 2022, we've seen a slump, unfortunately. Over the last 12 months, trust in government has fallen by nine points, media by eight points, business by five, NGOs by four. None of our institutions are trusted in Australia, which is a big difference from last year. Business and NGOs in government all sitting within neutral territory and media has gone back to a significant level of distrust. Now, just to note that when we talk about government in the trust barometer, we refer to the institution as a whole and not individual parties or politicians. Next slide, please. Um, as yeah, the headline is Australia's trust bubble has burst. And if we take a step back and look at trust over the last decade here, we can see trust falling to pre-pandemic levels. We, we had a good year last year. Our thesis last year was um, that Australia was experiencing a trust bubble, bubble and premature optimism of a pandemic recovery. Last year, we put the question out to Australia's leaders, what do you do with this rise in trust? Will you, will you use it or will you lose it? Um, 2021 came with some really unforeseen um, challenges. If you think back to the start of 2021, I think we were all hopeful. Um, it didn't quite play out that way. We saw new waves of the pandemic. Uh, we also saw high profile battles between industry and regulators. We had important and ongoing conversation around women's rights and protections. And there was even a sharper light cast on injustice and inequality. We asked tough questions about climate change, access to healthcare, education and affordable housing. All all in all, it seems that most of us were not quite ready for that return to normal that we're all hoping for, and we see that that's been reflected in this year's data. It seems that the trust bubble has burst. Next slide, please. Interesting, interestingly, I, I particularly like this slide as a bit of a data nerd. Um, the, dark, um, the dark triangle here is this year's findings as opposed to last year's findings. Um, and it's seen business is the only institution that's seen as both ethical and competent. Um, business has to lead the way. It's the only institution that's deemed equipped to do so. We've seen some major shifts since last year, and in contrast to media and government, it's clear that it's up to business and NGOs to take more action and play a more stabilising role in society. Next one, please. We did this for the first time this year, um, and millennials are the most trusting generation and the Gen Z are the least trusting. We see the picture more clearly when we break this down into four generations, Gen Z, millennials, Gen X and boomers. Millennials are emerging as the most trusting generation, whereas the youngest generation, Gen Z, are the least trusting, recording the lowest levels in trust across the board. This generational divide is real. Millennials are the next generation of Australian leaders waiting in the wings, and they're more inclined to trust than the generation that's going to succeed them. Next one, please. Um, this one really speaks to me. Uh, it's the continuing what we call the trust gap in Australia. Our data has, has shown a consistent trust inequality between Australia's highest, that's the in the top 25% of income depending um, for, per age, and the lowest income earners. The gap has closed slightly from um, last year. Last year we had the highest trust gap in the world. Um, but what's that, how that's actually changed is we've seen a 10-point drop from the top. Um, so the highest income earners have had a significant um, decline there. We are still seeing now a major disparity between those who think the system's working for them and those who are saying it is not. And as you can see, if you look over the years there, that there has been this um, 
healthy scepticism or disassociation from the lowest income earners in Australia for a long time. Now, just thinking about living, cost of living, we're having some debates around that. Wage growth is a bit stagnant. We've got to ask ourselves, how can we ensure our institutions work for everyone and not just for those at the top? Next slide, please. This one I think might be sobering for Cedar. You know, I know you've got the um, economic in your in your title. Um, we're seeing that people who believe that they and their families are going to be better off in, in five years' time, it's sitting at 41% in Australia. That is a significant decline. Um, for the first time, we're seeing a generation of Aussies who don't think that they're going to be off from better, better off than their parents. Um, this is something I think we all need to pause and take note about. It begs the question, how do we think this declining economic optimism might influence Australia heading to the, po the polls next um, this year? And also, if you go back to the Gen Z split, you've got Gen Z voting for the first time as well. I think it would be, you know, a tense time if you're in government. Next slide, please. I promise there's um, some hope at the end of this. These are all fairly sobering statistics. Um, this one, I think, is a worry. There's an increasing view that societal leaders are deliberately lying to us. More than six in 10 Australians believe that journalists, government leaders and business leaders are deliberately trying to mislead them by saying things that they know are false or gross exaggerations. And finally, the last glum one, and then I get to some good stuff. Um, one more slide, please. Um, distrust is the default, no basis for peaceful debate here. So Australians are pretty sceptical. We're a sceptical bunch and more than half of us have a default tendency to distrust something until they see evidence to make sure that that's trustworthy. Um, I'm actually stunned that the other stat on this page is not higher, but 61% um, of people think that we lack the ability to have constructive and civil debates about issues that we disagree on. Witness Twitter on any given day, it's a bin fire, and I don't think question time in the last week or so has been a better example. For us, when distrust is the fault, we lack the ability to debate or collaborate. For a democracy like ours, this is a pretty big warning sign. Here comes the good stuff. Okay, next slide. We have seen a really big personalisation in trust. Amid this um, widespread scepticism, we're finding a shift where Australians are placing their trust. It's become more personal. It's become people like me and people around me. While traditional authority uh, figures are fa facing their significant um, drops in trust, journos 12, 12 down points down, government leaders nine points down, and I would say that this was taken before um, Omicron came out, um, and um, CEOs down by five points. They're all sitting in distrusted ter um, territory. But if you look on the other side, my co-workers, people in my community, my own CEO, my own boss, um, and health and science authorities remain highly trusted. You know, we're seeing this personalisation of trust where people distrust institutions as a whole, they're more willing to trust those around them, like their co-workers, and those who can influence their personal health and wellbeing. Next slide, please. Here comes the expectation. With that trust comes expectation. And um, we haven't got the slide here, but fully eight out of 10 people expect CEOs to speak up on societal issues. They're expected to help um, inform and shape conversation and policy debates on a range of issues. 70% or more expect a CEO should inform and shape conversations around subjects specifically related to business, jobs, automation, wages, not unexpected. However, there's little public desire for CEOs to engage in elections. So the message is clear here, play the policy and not the politics. Next slide, please. This one, if you're a boss, should probably cheer you a little. My employer remains a bastion of trust. This is really important. Australians have told us they trust their employer above all other institutions. When we launched our trust, um, trust barometer last week, one of our panellists likened it to the boss kind of being the head of the tribe. You know, that's who you look to for the leadership. That's who you look to for a, a source of truth. There's responsibility in it, but there's also some power in it. Um, so if you think about continued hybrid working environments to new and improved um, employee engagement with new benefits to try and turn the tide of the great resignations, Australians are rewarding the actions of their employees have taken over the past year with um, high levels of trust. 
And finally, what do we do with all of this? Information quality is the most powerful trust builder across each of the institutions. It doesn't matter whether you're in business, NGO, government or media. If we're searching for a pathway to build back trust, all institutions need to look to quality information as the most powerful lever that they have at their disposal to build trust. It is the number one most powerful trust driver. So the questions that we need to ask ourselves are, how can we create, curate and share quality information in a way that's going to reassure my audiences, my stakeholders, my customers, my employees, my peers, my communities in ways that build trust? That is my dance through the results. Thank you uh, so much. There is so much in that to unpack, but I'd like to um, welcome into the conversation now, Yasmin. Now, look, Yasmin, I'm going to reflect on those intergenerational results. Um, our youth are the least trusting. And I'm wondering from your perspective and all of the work that you've done with our youth in Australia, what are you seeing that resonates with these results? Yeah, I mean, there's various approaches to this, but, you know, I was actually, you know, doing an interview last week and they were asking me actually about feminism and they were saying, what, what is Generation Z's feminism? What does that look like? And I think a lot of the time we're looking at this through a structural lens. We're seeing structural inequality. So we're seeing over time when it comes to things like, you know, wealth inequality to sexism to racism, this isn't just kind of a one-on-one -on -one type of thing, which I think previous discourse has focused on. This is, you know, embedded within institutions and I think that's maybe one source of the distrust the other side is that you know people our age we are we were born into social media first of all which has radically changed the nature of democracy and what that looks like for us um, we see you know we've grown up seeing criticism kind of being actively at our fingertips a really fast flow of information um, and that's a good thing and a bad thing and I do think that might lead to more distrust but um, perhaps you know fair criticism at the same time um, but also when we look at parliament it doesn't look like the kind of spaces that we um, see, you know, in, in our lives, and that includes business as well. It isn't just parliament, that includes the media. Um, we don't see our stories. Um, we don't see representation reflected. And it really feels kind of out of step with the way that my generation is thinking, um, you know, I, even things like, for example, intersectionality is an example of, you know, again, looking at the structural lens of thinking about class and race and, and gender. And when we look to our institutions, I think those conversations haven't evolved to the state that that my generation is, is talking about it. Um, another one, for example, is climate change, which is probably, you know, one of the top issues that young people are thinking about, even during the pandemic, um, you know, once again, taking to the streets and marching and striking. And that really was, I think, a generational shift and looking at our leaders and saying, you're meant to, you know, you're meant to not only think about the people that are voting for you, but your children and your children's children. And we have seen a really disappointing lack of action. So I think there is, you know, the social media piece and the kind of the failure to, to reflect what needs to be done to support future generations is something that is fueling that distrust. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the conversation is really shifting from, uh, you know, the sorts of, you know, discriminatory actions that we saw uh, and, you know, we've seen come to the fore over the last uh, a couple of years with regards to how women are treated and how, uh, you know, those groups that are in minorities are treated in our, by our institutions, you know, the lack of visible leadership and all the rest of it. The, um, the, the sophistication of the debate, so I think, really moved on from it's a few bad apples, but the rest of us are okay, to there's actually some structural problems that we need to actually un un unpick and address here. So, and I think that there's been a real maturity around that conversation, um, particularly with, for example, Kate Jenkins' report and, and such. So, which is good news, but we've got to then grasp all of the learnings from that and then make the change that we want to see. And that's where I think the, that flow through of action is really important. Now, Susan, I want to actually just go back a step and talk about the bubble, the trust bubble. Um, we saw it in our ethics index as well. Uh, ethics, our, our perception of ethical behaviour was high in 2021 when I was doing these results, our, our results at the end of that year. I, you know, pandemics are good for for our perception of ethics and trust. And then there's just been a crash in the last year. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? You talked a little bit about that, um, you know, the wheels of, of 
sort of some of the initial responses and the initial optimism around the pandemic, but it was more than that. There was a, a few things that the, where the reels, wheels really fell off. Well, if you think about where we were sitting at the end of 2020, you know, we didn't, we had almost no cases. People were moving about, you know, I don't think we're moving necessarily between states, um, but there was a hope and an optimism. Um, since then, we've had completely different treatments by states. Um, we've had bickering amongst the states. We've had a that whole localization, personalization. Let's face it, that worked for um, some of the state premiers. You know, they hunkering down worked for them. Uh, but then we've seen some really unfortunate debates happen elsewhere. And I think once JobKeeper and JobSeeker actually started to disappear, it, it then um, started to highlights the inequities that have been sitting there for a long time as well. Um, but there have been some pretty unfortunate things. And I wrote about this last week in, in Women's Agenda. Is I, I spoke today about playing the policy, not the politics. It does feel like we're playing the person, not the issue in public debate as well. Um, people are onto that. They don't like it. Um, and there's this a bit of a there's a bit of a cycle of distrust with government chasing votes and media chasing clicks um, and there's a real division that works um, in there. It works in terms of it does drive votes to a certain degree. It does drive clicks. I mean, I'm guilty of clicking on um, controversial headlines myself, but there's this under underlying unease about that. Indeed. Yasmin, are you seeing the same thing there and in your circles? Are you seeing uh, similar sorts of is issues? Um, as in, you know, the kind of distrust following the kind of lack of job seeker and job keeper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we're bringing it back to young people. Many young people are on the front lines of things like retail, of hospitality, and they are the first people to be messed about when it comes to the um, easing of restrictions that often put them at risk. And, you know, the, the same thing with taking away, you know, um, broader job keeper as well. So I, I certainly think we can see, and it's often been repeated, the pandemic has revealed the, the fault lines. It's been the X-ray of showing what has been broken. And I think it's only expanded that distrust for people that have had to bear the brunt of the policy. Um, and I think before often, you know, politics felt a bit far away, especially if you're a young person, it's kind of, there are debates going on there, but I'm focusing on my own life, but it's never been as tangible and as physical as it has been now because it directly puts people at risk, um, many of which are young people, many of which are, are women, many of which are culturally diverse. If we just look at the aged care industry, it's a highly diverse industry and, you know, had little to no protections during the pandemic as one example. Um, so, yeah, I certainly think because it's so close now, that might also fuel that frustration and distrust, especially if it feels like we're being taken for granted and, or put at risk. Yeah, and I wanted to talk a, a little bit more about the proximity bias that we see, and we see it through the results. You know, we don't trust employers, but we trust my own employer. We don't trust business or CEOs, but we trust my CEO. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that proximity bias, and it goes a little towards the point that that you're also making, Jasmine. Jasmine, when, when things affect us personally, it resonates very differently from when we see things in the abstract. But I think that particularly for our younger generations, they are seeing these issues through a lens where they feel a much more direct personal connection. So whether it be the women's agenda or climate change or some of the other social issues that we're seeing emerge, we are seeing a much more direct personal connection with those issues than necessarily um, how we saw them of yesteryear, which was that's a big job for the government to fix rather than a job that I'm going to personally engage with. Susan, is that something that you, you, you reflect on with the results, that proximity bias? And the real question that I want to ask you both is then, if we don't trust the leaders in an abstract sense, but we trust our own leaders, A, what can those abstract leaders do to improve their trust ratings, but also what do our leaders need to do to step up in terms of that public policy debate? So there, there, it's a lot of questions in there, but um, Susan, I'm going to go to you first. Well, I think the hints were in the findings that they're saying play the things that, you know, you have permission to play in. But if you think about some of the, the very high-profile CEOs in Australia, they are acting because it used to be, oh, it's all about return to the shareholder. 
it, it isn't so much anymore. A, you've got institutional investors who um, are pressuring people to act in totally different ways. So you've got that. Um, B, you have your own employees um, keeping people honest. And I know this will resonate with Yasmin as well. People have really high expectations of when they're joining an employer. You know, that comes into it more and more and more. Is this an organisation that I want to believe in and stand for? Um, and then there's the place, yeah, having permission to play in a certain place. So um, there's a Wear Super, for instance, I, I think is a really interesting one. Um, and we're seeing people, um, young people change super, I think, more often because they're actually, it isn't something traditionally young people worry about too much, having worked with super for a while. But if you look at Aware Super, people are choosing their super funds based on their ethos. Um, and Aware Super, as an example, I know is investing really heavily in affordable housing, um, which is a real pain point for anyone. I mean, I've got a, a 18 year old just about to go to uni and she informed us she's living at home till she's 30. So, you know, if Aware Super can help that, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, yeah, the, the, but it is becoming personal and you are answering as a leader to far more than a shareholder and far more than a regulator. You've got, you know, a 360 degree stakeholder universe and being going further than people expect you to do is really, really important, I think. Yeah, and just to jump off that, I mean, I'll start first with, you know, the kind of higher leadership, like politics. Um, you know, if we look to the, the movement that happened last year with women, that was a perfect example. And for young women were the most likely to be sexually harassed and assaulted. So that was, a, once again, a very close issue. And yet we saw that disconnect so, so clearly in higher politics where our experiences weren't reflected in the kind of debates that were happening. It was almost like an alternate universe where it was treated as just another political issue. And then we saw how that was received because we saw that playing politics is not how you talk about human rights and how you talk about equity and justice. This is something that should transcend politics. So I certainly think the way that, you know, once again, our stories aren't in the institutions, that's that's harming trust. Um, one way that could be, you know, could improve trust in those spaces, there's, there's so many different ideas. I've been advocating for a federal youth advisory board. So having a body of young people representing our voices, advising government. Um, the next is, you know, things like gender quotas or having that representation in those spaces. There's also more kind of structural reforms like deliberative democracy. So thinking about how can we get citizens, how can we change the model so that citizens are having a, a uh, more direct say when it comes to policy. Um, there's, you know, the movement with independence that also challenging the kind of two main two party systems. So kind of exciting ways to, to reframe what has traditionally been done into what can we do in a way that kind of more accurately and quickly reflects um, not only what the public are wanting, but the groups that are traditionally excluded, including young people. Um, when it comes to actual leadership, what Susan was saying is exactly right, which is that young people have pretty high expectations of their employer. But I think in our eyes, if we're going into a place of employment, that's going to be our life. That's where we're spending the majority of the time. And I remember when it came to Black Lives Matter back in 2020, there was a lot of scrutiny on businesses to say, what are you doing around this? Mm -hmm. And that included fashion. There was many young people my age looking at their favourite fashion brands and saying, hang on, I haven't seen any representation in your campaigns. What's with that? All the way to consulting companies and the best companies, in my opinion, were those that spoke honestly about the issue and that committed to doing something better within their organisation. And that included actually listing tangible changes that they would make. So not just saying something very kind of abstract, but saying racism is real. Um, we're committed to doing this and, and, and really being honest and authentic about that. So I, I remember, you know, with an organisation that I was working with, I actually had a, to, to kind of show how this is tangible and affects people's lives, I had a conversation with someone and they, they actually disclosed that they were transgender and they were going to, um, I guess, transition publicly um, soon and they were going to change their pronouns and ask to have their pronouns changed. And they were very afraid of what that would be received like within their employment, whether people would understand. So these are people's lives and these policies aren't just for you know for fun and just to, to show off these actually do make a difference in people's experience at work so I think always striving towards not only inclusion but also being publicly willing to be held accountable that's the sign of a, of a good and authentic and honest employer 
And, and to your point, what could these wider businesses do, in t- the wider business leaders, the broader ones, in terms of what could they do? You would use the word abstract. It's make, taking the abstract and making it concrete. So it's actually calling out great examples. And I know working with so many corporates or, and observing so many corporates that they are individually and collectively doing some amazing things. But we need to tell those stories, not just in a sort of a headline way, but tell it. And I was absolutely fascinated by the young Australian of the year, the street side medics doctor who, you know, noticed homeless people on his way home from the ED, actually set up um, a charity where they were started to go and um, treat people on the streets. And how did corporates use their power there? They saw that this was a really important worthwhile thing. So they actually helped with funding and partnering. So you sometimes see wonderful innovation in NGOs and government can, um, corporates can help them scale or corporates are doing things that are admirable and great. We are seeing, you know, entire factories that are run by um, solar power. There, there are all these examples, but we need to get out of the headlines and into the specifics because people connect with real stories. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think that's- very powerful. And we talked a little bit in our pre-briefing. Um, mind you, I've I'm, I'm got some great questions coming through Pigeonhole and I'm going to jump to one of those next. So keep them coming through and keep voting. But one of the things that we talked about in our pre-chat discussion is there are some uh, you know, um, insatiable problems that we're dealing with. And, and of course, you know, we've mentioned some of them, gender equity issues, um, uh, um, or equity issues per se. Uh, climate change, of course, is, is a big one. Um, you know, it's transition of our economy into a services economy. There's some really intractable problems that we're dealing with. And of course, we've been trying to deal with some of these problems for a long, long time. Climate change is not a new thing, by the way, nor is, is inequality in our society. So when we're dealing with these systemic issues, we are starting to see some new and quite disruptive styles of uh, individuals and Yasmin, of course, you're in this camp as well. But we've seen some other business leaders who are trying to get involved in this debate and do things in a different way and disrupt the systems, disrupt the the hierarchy and the systems. Um, how are they doing that? Can you uh, flash a, a couple of examples? I know we talked about some earlier, but also, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? And why why is it necessary? Well, if you do if you, if you if you do what you always do, you probably get what you're going to get what you always get. And probably the one that's dominating business headlines at the moment is Mike Cannon Brooks and his tilt to tilt AGL. You know, he's expressly gone after you know made a bid for AGL with the intent of bringing their closure of coal fired plant. Um, plants forward you know he has been really vocal on the environment and he is literally putting his money where his mouth is um we're seeing some really interesting commentary come out of that um and i know that we were talking about grace tame um just disrupting things in a different way she's not necessarily playing the game um I felt that there was a lot of a pile on about whether she smiled or not. And she's several times very eloquently brought it back to the issue. Um, Yasmin, I know you have strong feelings about that one too. So, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a, I mean, I think I made my views quite clear with that one that I think that it's just kind of uh, revealed the, the, the sexism that we always knew was there, but it's never been as clear as when it, you know, something as small as not smiling in a photo. I guess though on the kind of the point about the, about Mike, I think there's also kind of a healthy scepticism too that as the wealth inequality gap grows, we're seeing those that are the wealthiest have the power to set the agenda. And when it's used for good, that's great. But um, there was that debate when it came to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, um, you know, using their billions and billions of dollars to go to space. And people were saying, well, why don't you use that inequality? And I thought, well, why do they have that much money and power to begin with to decide where we're going to do, what we're going to do as a society when it comes to inequality? So I think there there is a healthy shakeup um, by people, you know, with not only cultural power, but, but economic power. But, you know, that, that again is resting on them to do the right thing. And we have to look at government and say, well, why aren't you doing this? And why aren't you using, you know, your resources to address something like climate change? Why do we have to rely on someone like Mike to step in and do something when we all know the existential threat of climate change? We all know it's hurtling towards us. What is wrong with our institutions that we can't pivot and move? Why are we stuck in the cement? And I think I, I, that's not kind of a new debate. We all We all know that. But I think that's the kind of... I think something that that does worry me 
Um, you know, we saw with COP, the recent COP um, conference, the way that, you know, again, leaders were just, they'd been hearing the threat of climate change again and again and again, but um, not very much came from that. So I think that where we are right now and the, the, um, the slow pace of change not matching up with the rate that we need to change, that's still an area of concern for me. Mm. I'm going to jump to um, some of our questions on pigeonhole, which are fantastic. And I'm going to um, stick with the one that's on a similar theme that we've been talking about, and that is if businesses are trusted but CEOs are not, how can business leaders take the lead people expect them to without appearing cynical? And it's really, I mean, we talked about how they can have more authentic voices, real examples, demonstrate their lived experience with issues. But how does that not decline into cynicism? Um, Susan, I was wondering if you'd have a stab at that. Um, I think it became, oh, this, this is a bit of um, communications jargon, but person-centred storytelling is something that I talk about a lot, your personal take. Um, one of our clients is Mike Boyle from HP, um, and I love him on LinkedIn. If you're not following him, I would suggest to go and have a look. Um, he talks about his personal take on projects that HP is doing, you know, the CEO sleep out, Women's Day, those sort of things. But he doesn't just go, oh, here we had a morning tea. He talks about his conversations with people and what he's learned. And I'm really struck um, by the words of our own Indigenous consultant that we have at, um, at Edelman. He says, you don't need to get it perfect. You just need to start and you need to listen and you need to learn. And so it doesn't need to be polished. It doesn't need to be perfect. But we, you talked about authenticity before as well. You know, being, And I would point to um, Rio Tinto's... Um, reaction to their to their own publishing a really damaging and hurtful report and saying this this has got to change and owning it and being transparent about it and I'm sure they were very nervous about publishing that but the reaction from the market including some of those really directional inst institutional investors has been marked so Yasmin, would you like to have a go at that one? From the youth of Australia's perspective, what do CEOs need to do to be able to take the leadership role in the public policy areas that we want them to but not decline into cynicism? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, touching back on my first point, well, my earlier point about speaking honestly and frankly and admitting mistakes but also committing to do better. And, you know, I previously I mentioned Black Lives Matter as a really good, for me, it was a barometer of where companies are at in terms of, Confr confronting and reckoning with these things because it isn't just having a, a nice morning tea it isn't just putting something in an email signature it needs to have um you know firm commitments and acknowledgement and what about what we need to do better but I also think there's you know there's powerful work that can be done internally so I'm on the board of Oz Harvest and they're frequently doing employee surveys of mental health of attitudes and feelings in the organization and they also respond to that so they say we are listening this is what we know and this is what we've heard and this is what we're going to do better so I think for CEOs it's really having an ear to the ground of what employees are feeling and being willing to actually um, respond to that frequently is is something that shows that you're an active listener and I think you know as humans to feel listened to is is one of the first things that we need to build trust so I think that's you know that there um, another thing is you know being dynamic and being able to respond to what what people are what, what's happening in the world so you know going back to Oz Harvest this is in the context of NGOs and I know not all businesses could do this but when the bushfires of 2020 first struck their, um, the boardroom ended up turning into like a operation room with all the maps of um, where there was um, a need for food and need for support. And they immediately pivoted to, to support um, what was happening there. When it came to the pandemic, they were mobilizing, they were supporting those in lockdown to get meals on the table. So um, they were actually able to point to the fact that they're constantly willing to be flexible and willing to provide support when necessary. So um, you know, the, the report, the Edelman report, um, showed that there is a lower level of trust in NGOs. So I think in that context, we need um, businesses to be kind of always looking out about looking around them rather than just internal about what people are wanting, what people are asking for and showing that they're actually being flexible. And I think that's, um, you know, that's a powerful mark of people that are listening. 
And business, business can help NGOs scale. They, you know, they're all these brilliant ideas and people coming up through their own passions and their own beliefs and they're trying something new. Um, but business also can be really quite agile and, um, and run a pilot project. Indeed, and Susan, I was going to say exactly the same thing. You know, partnering and collaboration is so important and, uh, and you know, of course, it's the rising tide that lifts all boats where there's no winners and losers um, if we can get winners and winners. Now, we've got a, a great question that's come through and it really goes back to a little bit about that conversation of proximity bias, but it's specifically around governments and the mistrust in governments. And that is we've seen state governments take the lead in the response to COVID. Are state governments trusted more than the federal government? And how much do people trust or even think about local government in their in their thoughts process on trust Susan do you have any insights on that well we we don't measure we measure government as a whole with this some um, state question comes up and we actually did last year a bit of a measurement um, state uh, state and federal and at the start of last year federal and state governments highly trusted local government really weren't terribly thought about local government at the time you know they're the people you pay the rates they take the rubbish and I'm sure if you're not they're not doing that you think about it um, but going back to the informa information quality piece at the start of last year, we had this steady drumbeat um, of you can set your watch by, you know, uh, the, the Premier is going to come and speak. Unfortunately, Dan Andrews and Gladys used to, to clash at the same time, but they used to come out, tell it straight, this is what you have to do. Um, and that worked very well. And people were looking for the interpretation from their own employer. So they'd watch that and go, okay, well, what is it that I need to do? And they'd wait for the word from the boss. So that both of those things increase trust. So I don't have data um, for state and local, um, but the trust, when we did do a little supplement last year, it was at the time federal first, state second and local. I would wonder whether that's changed and I'd be so fascinated to see, um, say, I don't know, New South Wales versus WA because Fortress WA has worked extremely well for them. It's, mm -hmm. you know, for me personally, my brother lives in Perth. I haven't seen him for two and a half years. So there's some frustration at my end, but that's because I'm where I am, I think. Indeed, and I think, well, Fortress Queensland was a little the same, um, so I think that's true. Now, while we're on um, your fabulous results, there's another question that's come through, and that's on the media specifically, uh, and we had a bit of a chat about um, Grace Tame's open letter to the media, and and but how the media works in general, and now I, I know that for you guys it's exactly the same as us. The media is, once again, a large pool. We've got mainstream media right through to social. So first and foremost, Susan, perhaps if you want to just reflect on the differentials between those aspects of media within the results, because I think that that is important. But then the second question, and that's the important one for both of you, and that is how can the media rebuild trust? It is such an important institution. So, look, I had a big discussion um, with ABC last week who were very interested in these results. Um, so the traditional media, just from memory, traditional media was sitting at 48% trust, whereas social media was sitting at 25%. So in that there was traditional um, search engines owned media, so, you know, people's own channels. Owned media, I think, was about 33%. Um, so traditional media was definitely sitting higher, but they were still in mistrusted territory at 48%. Uh, I think the social finding is goes to that, uh, the finding in this uh, that I did share with you, which was about mistrusting things until you see the evidence. I've certainly shared things and people have gone, what's your source straight away? People you know, will keep you honest. Or if I see a piece of news on social, I'll go and actually look at a, a major masthead. So we did see a, a flight to quality, so known mastheads, but that trust has dripped, has dripped away. And I do think it's... Um, yeah, there's a bit of an ideological split. People think that media have some media have their own agenda, but of course the question is: media are people thinking about pundits or are they thinking about newsrooms? You know, newsrooms really do try to get things straight. Um, you, we spend a lot of time looking at columnists and commentators, and who sometimes become part of the story, as they did with the Grace Tame. Um, issue. You know, someone came out and said, "Well, she shouldn't have gone," and that ended up. Um, being a whole new cycle in itself. Um, 
it's maddening and it's exhausting. People people want the facts and they want that information quality. And um, I'm looking at the slide, which has, yeah, the things that media can do to increase trust, information quality, communication, transparency, exert their power effectively. You know, there is definitely a, a confirmation bias. People look to the mastheads that they read to believe it and actively disbelieve others um, and holding others accountable, which, of course, is what the fourth estate's all about. Mm. Yes, man. If you were the media advisor, um, what would you be suggesting um, on top of that? We talked a little bit about the, the open letter to the media and how the media responded and the institution of media. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess to that question, the first thing I thought about was that petition by Kevin Rudd about Murdoch Media, which was record-breaking in signatures, calling for further scrutiny of that. So I think there is a general appetite in the public and a a general and I think healthy dose of scepticism about what we've been reading. And I think when it comes to, you know, things like um, your racist dog whistling, that's definitely been driven by the media for for decades. So... um, What I think has been encouraging as a young person is seeing more and more new media outlets that don't take that same divisive tone that have had enormous success. So I recently met the founder of The Daily, which is a Instagram, was started on Instagram. It's, um, you know, media outlet that has kind of digestible um, news presented in a a kind of um, easy to understand way that has, I think, hundreds and maybe 200,000 plus followers on Instagram and they recently released even a a survey just on their Instagram story and they got 40,000 responses Um, that was about young people's attitudes to COVID. We see women's agenda as well which is determined to break through that news cycle and actually tell women's stories and tell women's point of views that hasn't been captured by the current state of the media. So I think there are so many different inroads to make in terms of telling stories differently with the people that traditionally haven't been represented in the kind of mainstream media news outlets that are stuck in that same divisive news cycle. And I also think there's something to be said that, you know, you look at ABC versus news.com.au and which one are you going to be trusting more? And I think, you know, just by reading it, often people can already see through that kind of division. So I'm encouraged by the new independent media sources that are committed to telling things differently. Um, And I, I think people are resonating with that so I'm, I'm excited to see what comes from that and I think with the social media space like Instagram and TikTok um, you know I've been seeing the Guardian for example being making inroads for young people through TikTok as well so there are many I think new exciting media forums that can can I guess cut through cut through that division in the sense of telling stories differently. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, from my perspective there, I think it's really important. Um, one of the challenges with the way that we consume our media these days, and it is through usually, you know, on your device in some way, shape or form, whether that be the Sydney Morning Herald um, through the app or whether it be a women's agenda by an email or whether it be something else that you see through Instagram. And part or, or you know, we know there's lots of, of fake news out there on, on Facebook and the like, which they're trying to tackle. Part of the challenge that we've got, though, is this is this uh, echo chamber that we fall into, where the algorithms then feed you more and more news pieces of news articles from those sorts of sources. And I think it is really incumbent on us as informed individuals to broaden our reach and make sure that we are actually clicking on both sides of arguments so that we are being informed in our views. Because, of course, we talk about institutional bias in some of the mainstream media, but, of course, all media outlets are going to ultimately be informed by the bias, either conscious or unconscious, of their leadership because organisations are informed by the culture that is set, the tone that is set by the leadership of those organisations. And, look, we've got an actually really interesting question that flows on from that, and that is, is the income trust gap about being informed or is it about who the system works for? Uh, and so, Yasma, I'm going to go to you with this question first because I, I know you've got strong views on this. It's yeah. a fabulous question. Um, sorry, did you say Yasmin oh, first? I did say Yasmin oh, first. Sorry, I was too excited, Yasmin, you go. <laughs> I think we're probably going to agree on this one. Um, but, yeah, I think it, it is definitely reflective of who the system works for. And if we think about, um, you know, the pandemic, it's it's no surprise that the people, once again, who are on the front lines and are less likely to be um, to, to have privilege, they're the ones that, um, you know, feel, feel hard done by and, and feel wronged and, you know, 
the, the same thing even goes for I was reading, you know, migrants are more likely to be to be skeptical of of government, and that makes a lot of sense if you're a you know temporary migrant worker, for example, and and simply you know just aren't don't have a, a voice and an entryway into parliament. So, um, yeah, I think that I think that's an important context, and that, that's I think why it's more important than ever when we think about these results to also be thinking about class and race and sexuality. And it comes back, I think, the most simple visual aspect of that, just looking at the spaces of decision making and who does that look like? Who does that actually represent? And who's, whose views are mainstream and who are the people that have to really fight to, to get their point of view heard? And, um, you know, I talked about women, I talked about um, about race, and it, it's it's really difficult. And I think even actually getting those opinions in the public debate can be pretty bruising. Um, earlier before this call started, we were talking about the way that um, advocates are often treated, including in the media. We talked about Grace Tame, but there's also people like Yasmin Abdul Majid and, and other advocates that have, um, you know, really been. It's it, it's really difficult to to actually get these views heard, and it can, um, you know, even as a youth advocate, it, it can be quite scary to put that on on the the front line so I think whose whose voice is it more easier to to already have a platform um and then you know if you see yourself heard and you see yourself represented well of course that's going to to build trust and the people that don't see themselves represented well of course that's going to create distrust too so we did have it's not it's the findings not because this is a selection of the findings but we also had a um a result which was more than half of Australians don't think that capital capitalism um as it stands is working for them uh, if by nature you are commuting longer distances you are you know struggling with rent um that you know, you're struggling to put quality food on the table you your work might be casualized or at risk of automation no, the system is not working for you. Yeah, and this is, it's been very clear, it's been coming through all the way. Um, there was one finding in the initial results as well, which showed that in that bottom quartile of um, income, the ones that were more informed in terms of engagement with media and opinion and politics were slightly more trusting. Mm -hmm. So, but people are turning away from the systems that aren't working for them. You know, it feels tough. Um, that's what this uh, pandemic has really shone a light on, but it ain't it ain't nothing new. And it, it's we we talked about honesty and transparency. I'd like to add empathy and kindness to the, to this as well. Um, just because it's working for some of us doesn't mean it's working for the rest. And that's our responsibility. That's what people are, are realizing. That's why you are seeing action and some pretty impressive action in some places. But you know to really so those pieces of innovation and different approaches together, it's collaboration, not just between business and NGOs, but business and NGOs in government. You know, I know a lot of people who work very, very hard in government. And if you take them, you know, an innovative approach to something, they are quite often willing to co-fund to co a trial or a pilot to see if that works because they do deeply understand what the issues are. The business of government is by nature slower, uh, you need to do more consultation. I'm not going to sit here and pile on because I know so many people who do amazing work. But if we work together, it's a little bit, you know, kumbaya, but that's actually where the solutions are going to come from. Yeah, and I also, I also think there's a difference between, you know, the, the system not working versus just being dissatisfied with the political party. And it's okay to not be happy if you look at the government and say, I'm frustrated, I don't trust, you know, I don't, I don't feel trust. But if you look at the other, you know, the other main political party and you're still not happy and you still don't see yourself represented and you still don't see, um, you, you see the same problems over and over again. I think that's where the distrust builds and that's when the system becomes the issue, not just the current government, for example. So I think there's, you know, more and more um, people that are looking at major political parties and, and are, are quite frustrated about the process and about those policies not being on the table and the, the lack of... Um, risk taking and risk appetite in politics is is very strong so I think that's you know what's also driving that view as well yeah I was having this conversation with someone just last week and in fact there's a question along the vein but we, we're not going to get all, all the questions today but it particularly separating out you know the 
political side of things from the bureaucracy side of government, I think is really important distinction to be made. And, and particularly when you're working in systems, and we talked about you know, the challenges of the institution itself and the style of the institution, when you're talking about institutions where successes are widely shared, but failures are acutely felt, um, then, you know, that that doesn't breed the right environment, the right culture for trying new innovative ways of solving the big problems of society. Now, we are nearly out of time. I'm going to throw a really, really quick question to you, Susan, because we've had it come through and a few people have voted on it. And uh, and that is um, the old gender split, talking about who the system works for and who it doesn't. Are women more trusting or men? Uh, We don't actually do a gender split, and I did actually go back and ask specifically about this as a bit of a righteous woman, you know, in my spare time. Apparently, we have done gender splits many, many times in the past, and they've never been remarkable enough to include. There you go. So there you go. The cynicism is real amongst us, and I do acknowledge that we do not have a particularly diverse panel here today. Uh, we we did try, but um, on this occasion we failed, and and I do apologise. Look, on that note, I am going to start to wrap us up. Um, look, I can't thank you enough, Susan and Yasmin. We could probably um, sit in a room, probably enjoying a nice beverage, and talk about these issues all day. Um, I know that we've been looking at this trust barometer for, for years and years and years. We It's a, a great survey because it gives us food for thought on how we can improve these things that, as I, as I said, they really are the fabric of society. What makes us function? It also helps to make us listen to each other. And I think that's been really lacking in a lot of our debates, not just for the last couple of years, but really over the last decade, you know, being informed Um, But being open minded enough to listen to another person's point of view. And I I know that's one of the reasons that I'm so honoured to be involved with CEDA, because CEDA does try to present a platform for different points of view to be heard and reasoned and rationaled out. So um, it is really, really important thing to me. I'd like to extend my thanks to both of you today, Susan and Yasmin, for um, making yourselves available, obviously, and participating and sharing your insights and thoughts and your expertise. Thank you so much and of course I'd like to once again thank Edelman for Australia for your partnership your support to CEDA is very valued and it really does allow us to continue to convene important conversations like this so thank you uh, to you Susan and to Edelman Australia now audience please take a minute before you log off pigeonhole don't go away just yet we would like you to provide your feedback on today's event and rank the discussion we're going to get a ranking ourselves, talking about a, a trust barometer. We're going to get uh, barometered ourselves. So please go into Pigeonhole and rank the discussion um, and give your feedback on today. And, of course, finally, I'd like to thank you, all of our audience that have signed in today from wherever you are in Australia, whether that be in your bedroom like a lot of us or from an office for those of us that can get back into the office and it's exciting to be able to do so. But for your time and participation in the discussion, and I remind you all that the discussion has been recorded. So if you'd like to uh, share that, uh, it'll be available shortly by the live stream link and then on the CEDA website um, publicly for uh, those that weren't sensible enough to come along uh, today on time. So they, they can access it a little bit later so you can share it with your colleagues and network. Uh, And you can keep up to date on CEDA's program of events by visiting www.ceda.com.au and register for the upcoming live streams. And we have got some fantastic ones. Um, On February the 24th, we've got Australia's Digital Future, Evolving the Consumer Data Right with Digital Economy, and that's with Minister Jane Hume. And on March the 2nd, we have Addressing the Gender Wealth Gap, and that is where we will be joining my fellow director, Uh, of CEDA Ming Long AM ahead of International Women's Day as we deconstruct the gender wealth gap in Australia. So on that note, um, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes left in your very busy days. Thank you once again so much to Susan and Yasmin and to Edelman Australia and please enjoy the rest of your day.